I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, and welcome to this episode of Ham Radio Answers. Taking a break from antennas today, let's look at VHF and UHF FM answering the question, how do I program my radio? There are often multiple ways, but before we dig into them, let's take a look at some of the parameters we'll encounter both for simplex settings and repeater settings. Let's also look just at analog voice FM settings because FM radios are still far more common than digital modes. Given that Chirp is probably the most commonly used software to program radios, let's use a page from the Chirp website as our guide, one entitled Understanding Chirp's Columns. The first column is LOC. LOC. That doesn't refer to the geographic location of the repeater or your radio, but simply which memory channel is being used in your radio. Usually LOC starts with one and then goes up, but some radios have priority channels that are numbered differently. Chirp automatically knows how many channels your radio has. Some radios have hundreds. I've never used more than about 15, but then I'm not terribly active on VHF and UHF. Your radio, whether a handheld or a mobile, has both a memory mode and a VFO mode. In memory mode, everything is contained in a channel that you have previously defined. In VFO mode, you can enter a frequency at random either via the keypad or by rotating the tuning knob. Now, these two modes are called different things by different manufacturers. For example, I have a Chinese radio that uh, has channel mode, meaning memory mode, and frequency mode, meaning VFO mode. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. If you set up a VFO frequency the way you want it, using the radio's front panel, including tones and a name and so on, you can simply write all of that into a memory channel. In some radios, this is the only method for putting a channel into memory. And here's another secret. If you use programming software to set up your radio, please note that such software almost always works by downloading the entire memory contents into the computer and when you are done tweaking, you upload the entire contents from the computer to completely overwrite everything on the radio. I've had questions from folks saying they uploaded some memory channels and then without saving that in computer memory have uploaded another set of channels and then the first uploaded set disappears. This is perfectly normal behavior. Just remember that when you upload, you are uploading the entire contents and will overwrite absolutely everything. And, by the way, keep a copy of your settings by saving it to the computer in Chirp or whatever software you use. Okay, turning now to the definitions. The frequency is the receive frequency of the radio you are programming. Another way of looking at this is it's the transmitting frequency of the repeater that you want to hear. You will see a repeater listed as, for example, 147.195, a plus sign, and a tone frequency like 107.4 or 107.2. The 147.195 is the frequency you want your radio to listen on. Name in Chirp is the alphanumeric name which your radio will show when you are tuned to that memory channel. Different radios allow different name lengths. Often it's only six or seven characters. Make these names something that you can pick out at a glance, for example, while you're mobile. For example, there's a nearby repeater on a local geographic feature called Flat Top. That's seven characters. I could use flato or flatop or flatop or even just flat. 
You can enter names from the front panel of most radios, but it's often tedious to do so, and setting them in software is much easier. Tone mode has to do with a way devised, I think, by Motorola many years ago to get around a funny phenomenon called Intermod. Most repeaters start out with a simple device called a carrier operated relay or core that would turn on the repeater whenever the receiver sensed an FM carrier. That means when the repeater hears a carrier such as yours, it will go into repeater mode and repeat the audio input onto the audio output. That works just fine in many instances. However, in areas where there's a lot of RF about, funny mixing effects called intermodulation can conspire to create enough noise that the carrier operated relay in the repeater thinks there's an input signal. This turns on the repeater output, which can sound like garbage and annoy those monitoring the repeater. To fight this, many repeaters use what is called Continuous Tone Coded Squelch System, or CTCSS, or sometimes just Tone. When a carrier is strong enough to gain the attention of a repeater, it looks in the audio for a subaudible tone at a specific frequency. If that specific tone is not there, the repeater will not open. So if the repeater requires that tone and you don't provide it, you won't get to use the repeater. Shown in the graphic is the entire list of subaudible tones used by amateurs. If you have a VHF or UHF radio that is even remotely current, your radio will transmit these tones upon command. There's another type of code, sometimes but rarely used in the United States, called Digital Tone Coded Squelch, or DTCS, sometimes called Digital Coded Squelch, or DCS. As the name implies, the repeater is looking not just for a tone, but for a digital word to be sent continuously from the transmitter on a subaudible tone carrier. The complete list of digital codes used is in the graphic. Note that this is more robust than simple CTCSS because the listening repeater is far less likely to be fooled by noise that might fool a CTSS system. However, CTCSS, or more frequently just tone, is still the most common way to do it. I point out that there's an entirely different system used in Europe. At the beginning of each transmission, there's a 1750 hertz tone burst, which is right in the middle, uh, middle of the audio frequencies, that will open the repeater channel. Most radios sold in the USA have this feature tucked away somewhere. This brings us to tone mode. If none, it means just that. The most common mode is simply tone, which in this context means that your transceiver transmits the CTCSS tone required by the repeater, but anybody listening on the repeater output can hear you. There are, as you might imagine, many variations on this. TSQL, meaning tone squelch, means your radio sends the required tone but your own radio squelch won't open unless it hears the repeater transmitting the same tone. This is sometimes used in high noise locations. Note that the same trick can be used on simplex so that you can hear your radio only when the other station transmits the same tone. Now, note this. Most repeaters do not repeat subaudible tones. Most analog repeaters have a single tone detector, but the low frequency tones are below the minimum audio cutoff frequency, usually somewhere around 300 hertz. Now for musicians, this might seem high, especially given the middle C is about 256 hertz, but the frequencies that carry the intelligibility of speech are higher than that. 
I realize that all these different ways to use tones is complicated, but in most cases only the CTCSS tone that must be transmitted by your transceiver is all that's used. You can usually tell when your radio is set up for this because a small capital T shows up on the screen somewhere. Oh, and I point out that all of this goes for the DTCS method as well. A very few repeater systems use tones in weird ways called crosstones. So few that it's only worth learning if your particular repeater uses it. Now, there's one minor addition here, and that has to do with the digital tone coded squelch, which has what's called a polarity, which simply refers to whether the most significant bit or the least significant bit is sent first. Now let's discuss the duplex setting. Unlike in the rest of the telecommunications world, amateur usage of the term duplex means that two frequencies are involved. You transmit on one frequency and listen on another. This is reversed at the repeater, which listens on your transmit frequency and transmits on your listening frequency. In chirp, if you select none, then your transmit and receive frequencies are the same, which hams call simplex. If set to a plus or minus sign, your device will transmit above or below the received frequency. The amount of difference is standardized in the United States on 600 kilohertz for two meters and five megahertz for 70 centimeters. Now I note here that some programming software requires that you put in the actual transmitting frequency. If so, on two meters, add or subtract 600 kilohertz. For example, that repeater I spoke of earlier, 147.195 with plus sign and 107.2 hertz, transmits on 147.795 megahertz and uses a tone frequency of 107.2 hertz. Now, many radios can hear different modes. All transmit on FM. Just FM means what's called in the telecommunications world wideband FM. This is the amateur standard, and you use this unless your repeater operator requires you to use narrowband, which happens in some crowded areas. Now, Chirp uses WFM for broadcast band FM, which is really wide, like a couple hundred kilohertz wide. It's interesting to note that the wider the deviation, the greater the sensitivity of the radio. The five kilohertz that we use in amateur radio is kind of a trade-off, and it's what commercial radio did for a long time, before they decided they had to double the number of frequencies and hence went to narrowband. Some radios can listen to aircraft transmission, which uses AM just as they have for maybe 80 years or so. Why do aircraft not use FM or at least SSB? Well, the answer is tradition. It's really hard to change habits after they become entrenched. Now, the tuning step is for VFO mode. It describes how much tuning varies with each click of the knob. It is sometimes as low as 2.5 kilohertz or as wide as 30 kilohertz. In general, if you set this to 5 kilohertz, you're fine. If it turns out there's a repeater whose frequency has four digits after the decimal point, such as 147.1825, then you'll need to use a 2.5 kilohertz step. But generally, you can get away with five. Now, you may say that channels in your area are 30 kilohertz apart. If that's so, by all means, set the step to that. But I've found that in various parts of the country, there's no standardization as to where that particular 30 kilohertz starts, and you may find yourself cattywampus to the world. Using 5 kilohertz solves that problem. Chirp lists one more parameter called skip. This has nothing to do with propagation, but whether you want to skip a channel while scanning. For example, 
I put the local NOAA weather transmitter into a memory, but then put an S in chirp to direct the radio to skip that channel when scanning. Otherwise, the scanning will come across that channel and get stuck there because they're always transmitting. Okay, well, <laughs> that's a lot of information. Now, get out your owner's manual and give it a good read with your radio right in front of you. Most radios should allow you to enter receiving frequency, split direction, tone, and tone frequency from the front panel and then allow you to store this in a memory for future use. Sometimes you'll need to do this on the fly. Best to know how. Maybe build a little cheat sheet and practice. I was once at the scene of an accident in the high country and I probably could have found a repeater that could have heard me, but I didn't have the right ones programmed in and didn't know how to use my Oshing on a new frequency. We had to rely on someone in our party to drive a few miles to the nearest telephone. I was quite embarrassed by that and I hope I never run into that problem again. The moral of the story? Learn your radio. Carry its documentation with you. Prepare a checklist. Have in hand at least a list of nearby repeaters along with offsets and tones. And know which repeaters in your area are in common use versus those that are so quiet that no one may be monitoring. Thanks for being a subscriber and clicking like. Thanks for considering the tip jar and patreon.com slash ke0og. I've set up a page on my website at ke0og.net slash support, which shows various ways you can support ham radio answers and my Ask Day videos. I'll conclude with some partial eclipse photos taken by using a simple pinhole on a 3x5 card. Also, here's a phenomenon I've seen during previous ellipses. When the sun comes through the trees, see all the mini eclipses on the ground? I hope you had an opportunity to see the eclipse, and while doing so, you used both feet when walking. Until we next meet, 73.